Hey guys, Jared Wesley here of Live Traders and it is that time of the week. It is lecture time and this week's topic guys is called Be Robotic, Not idiotic okay we see traders all the time do a lot of foolish and stupid things and the reason for that mostly is because well they're not following their trading plan or they don't have a trading plan so today we're going to talk about how you can be robotic robotic indifference unconscious competence conscious competence conscious un incompetence etc so we're going to go down a whole list of things that talk a little bit about your mental approach in trading that will be the first part of the lecture and the second part of the lecture guys will be talking about know your trade know the trade and what i mean specifically by that is simply know the expectation know what type of trade you're getting into and what is the expectation for that particular type of trade. For example, if you get into a three bar play or you get into a breakout, the expectation for that trade is a lot different than if you get into a parabolic or if you get into a buy setup and you're thinking, what do you mean by that, Jared? What I mean is, for example, a three bar play is a momentum trade and that's supposed to hit and run. And if it doesn't, we have to question it, okay? If you get into a double bottom retest buy setup, well, it's gonna chop around a little bit. So you wouldn't be nearly as concerned if you got into a double bottom retest buy setup and it didn't immediately shoot to the sky. But if you got into a three bar play and it starts chopping around, that's a problem. So we're gonna talk about how you dissect those types of trades and knowing the expectation will let you know the likelihood of whether or not it's gonna work. And what's that gonna do for you? Help you get out of some trades that maybe you shouldn't be in after entry. You wouldn't know it before entry, but after entry, okay? So again, be robotic, not idiotic. We'll talk about the mental frame of mind as well as knowing trades and knowing the expectation for those trades so you can better manage those trades more effectively and more profitably. As always, guys, if you like the channel, please click, click, click the like button, smash, hammer the subscribe button, guys. Come on, man. There's some awesome content on this channel. All the other stuff out there is fluff, 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 and their subscribers are killing it. We need more subs here. Come on, help me out. Don't forget those click notifications. I am Jared Wesley of Live Traders. Let's get to it. Today's topic is be robotic, not idiotic. And you're like, well, what does that mean? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about robotic indifference today, conscious competence, unconscious competence, incompetence, all that kind of stuff, but it's a two-part lecture. It's twofold. I could probably divide it up into two. Um, then we're going to talk about expectations for your trades, and I think this is a slight extension of topics we've talked about the last couple of weeks. We've talked about bar by bar analysis. We've talked about how to get out of bad trades, not stay out of losing trades. I mean, after you get in, we've talked about how you can mitigate loss um, by looking at bar by bars. Well, we're going to expand on that today and talk about what an expectation for a trade should look like and what happens when you get into a trade with a certain expectation and that expectation isn't met? What should you do? So we're going to talk about that today. Uh, if you'll notice, this past few weeks, this past month, this series, if you'll call it that, has basically been on how to stay out of trouble. Now, why would I pick such a series at this time? Because, well, the market's been choppier than normal. And a lot of people are very rigid with their approach, which generally is a good thing. Okay, generally good. Um, but that rigidity, rigidity uh, has, been, has been costing them money. So we want to talk about maybe other avenues where you can look into the bars and help yourself stay out of trouble. But before we do any of that, let's do a when will the insanity stop segment. Um, this one is not quite you know, up to the normal level that you're used to in terms of the egregiousness of money. Because uh, it doesn't even really talk about money. Um, but it's just the the idea of a victim mentality. Okay, so we're not talking about some, you know, 23-year-old Russian oligarch son who lost $50 million. Like, it's not that. But it's the attitude that caught me on this one. Okay, it's the attitude. So let's take a quick look. All right, so... Doge BTC. It's a major Ponzi scheme referring to Bitcoin BTC. The 1% got in early and held while the poor, the poor guys, you know, the poor scramble to buy fractions of it now. Idiots. 
Buy Doge now and be part of the 1% who gets in early. Okay, so there's all kinds of problems with this. Just all kinds of problems. The 1% got in early while the poor scramble to buy fractions. Well, I don't know, but it's been available on the open market for a long time now. Um, you could have bought some a long time ago and made a heck of a lot of money on it, but you didn't. So there's a victim mentality right there. There's also this misery loves company mentality where, hey, it's us against them, rich against poor, blah, blah, blah. I'll give you a little hint, guys, okay? Sorry to say this, it's just the facts. Absolutely unequivocally broke poor people don't invest in the stock market. They don't buy Bitcoin because they don't have the money to. They're focused on buying basic necessities. Okay, so that and already in and of itself has a problem. But then we go on to the, the latter half of this and be a part of the one percent it gets in early. And then you read the bottom and it says around a hundred people control Doge's entire forty six billion dollar market cap. In fact, just five wallets control forty percent of the entire coin supply. Huh, and you're talking about the one percent who got in early while the poor scramble to buy fractions? Huh? Some of this stuff you just can't make up. Unfortunately, this is a microcosm of a general problem we have in society these days, and that is the victim mentality. Okay, you are not a victim of anything if you're investing in the stock market because you get the ultimate choice of what, when, and how much you want to invest in the market. Let me repeat that you get the choice of what you want to invest, when you want to invest it, and how much money you want to put in the stock market. Stop being a little bitch. Stop complaining, man. It's probably the greatest meritocracy there is because nobody knows you. You just put some money into the market where you think it's it's a good place to put it and make money or lose money. It's nobody's, it's not the market's fault. It's your fault. You chose that company. You chose when to buy it. You chose the symbol to buy and you chose how much money to put in. Just stop the shenanigans because this type of attitude, one, is not only destroying the country, but it's destroying most traders because most traders have a victim mentality, which is also why this leads into robotic indifference, be robotic, not idiotic, okay? So that's what we're going to talk about um, today because I could go off on this, this comment about victim mentality and the 1% got in early, the poor scrambled, blah, 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 blah. I could talk about it all day, but we don't have that kind of time today. So let's dig in. Be robotic, not idiotic. What does this even mean, okay? Well, at some point in your trading, you're going to earn, and that's the key, you're going to earn the right to have discretion. But when you're new, you don't have the right. You haven't earned the right to have discretion, meaning you need to do things by the book, properly, robotically. And when you have proven that you can do something robotically as it's taught, then you earn the right to have a little bit of discretion in your trading. And we'll talk about some of that discretion in the latter half of this lecture. Um, but in the beginning, this is how it really starts. Oops, wrong side. This is how it starts for most people, okay? And this isn't just trading. This is life, okay? Unconscious incompetence, okay? This means the trader neither understands or knows how to do something, nor recognizes the deficit or has a desire to address it. Okay, this means you just don't know what you don't know. Okay, you're so incompetent, you don't even realize the level of incompetence. It's just unconscious. You're just incompetent. Guess what? That's not a negative. That's not a knock on your ego. That's just called, you know, being human. Okay, we don't know certain things or anything until they've been taught to us in some capacity. You're unconsciously incompetent. All right. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with being in this, in this stage. But this is also the area that causes some of the most stress and grief for traders. See, when you're consciously incompetent, which we'll talk about, you're conscious of your incompetence. And you know, like, you know what? I need to get my learn on. But when you're unconsciously incompetent, this is when you fall victim and fall prey to what? Furus crazy advertising like people turning $517 into $300,000 in one year. This is, when, this is when you're at most vulnerable 
been to those get-rich-quick type attitudes and schemes, all right? And for some reason, and I can't explain why, people feel that trading will be different. It may take you eight years to be a doctor, but doctors feel like they should be great traders in one year. Hey, doctors out there, would you choose someone who's a first-year college student who's not even a medical student, pre-med, to operate on somebody? No, you wouldn't. Why? Well, that's just dumb, Jared. They don't have the experience. Um, yeah. You know, the rest of the world understands that. So why is it then in trading you feel it's going to be different? Eight years to be a doctor, 12 years to be a doctor, residency, medical school, pre-med, all that good stuff. But trading's going to be different. That, that's just stupid. I don't even know if that's unconsciously incompetent. That's just dumb. But this is the most dangerous of the four stages here because you just don't know what you don't know, so you're far easier to trick. It's like the average voter in America. They're just unconsciously incompetent, okay? Now, the next step is conscious incompetence, all right? So you sit there and you've recognized, you know what? I know I don't understand something. I haven't yet taken the steps to fix this problem. I have not addressed this issue yet, but I know I don't know. That's a positive, that's a, that's a step in the right direction, okay? It's kind of like an alcoholic admitting, I have a problem. They have not addressed the problem, but I have finally taken the first step of admittance or acceptance, as they would say, I guess, in Dabda, okay? So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. The next one, these next two are really the important ones. Conscious competence. The trader understands or knows how to do something. However, demonstrating the skill or knowledge requires a great deal of concentration. This is what? You know what this is. I know what the right thing to do is but I'm really having a hard time doing it, okay? You're out in the boondocks, nobody's there, there's nobody around for 100 miles, and Halle Berry happens to appear in your room. You're married, though. Oh, boy. I know what I'm supposed to not be doing right now. But, um, man, it's really hard. You see what I'm getting at? This is pretty much what I would consider, quote, the average trader. The average trader goes through these mental gymnastics every single day, okay? They know the right thing to do most of the time. Sure, there are going to be certain situations you don't know, but most, 80, 90% of the time, you, you know what you're supposed to be doing. And also, well, what you shouldn't be doing. But you just can't help yourself, you know? You just can't help yourself. Um, and then you get to a level after sitting in conscious confidence. Now, and here's the rub. The people who do make it to the unconscious competence level are the ones who have a healthy understanding of their personalities and their objective about it. They put the ego in the closet. Remember we talked about parking your ego in the closet last week or the week before? Well, consciously competent people, the ones that succeed in trading, are the ones that are able to accept who they really are. They're not lying about themselves. They're not lying to themselves. Most of you are doing exactly that. Just admit it. You're lying to yourself. What are you really saying? You're saying, well, I'll be different tomorrow. But then tomorrow comes and you do the same thing. Well, I'll be different the next day. Then the next day comes and you do the same thing. And then you're so pissed off. It's Friday. You go have some beers and you're like, you know what? I'm going to meditate this weekend. I'm going to go on a hike. I'm going to go on a retreat. I'm going to go listen to some Tony Robbins. I'm going to go listen to some Ed Milet. Whatever. Monday comes around. You do the same damn thing. You're lying to yourself. And what's the reason for this? Because your ego is either too big or you haven't set up a severe enough consequence system. Really, I mean, we, we do or don't do things in society because of the reaction we might receive, right? You, you don't, you know, you've heard me say this a million times, but you don't do 100 miles an hour on the highway because, well, you probably don't want to get pulled over, get a ticket or get arrested, right? Well, we have societal norms and rules we follow. Well, there's trading norms that we need to follow also, but in order for us to actually follow them and get to the unconscious competence stage or level, you're going to have to go through some pain, which is checking your ego at the door and having consequences for not following the rules. Now, it's a rhetorical question. I don't need you to raise your hands. They'd be virtual hands anyway. How many of you truly have significant, and I mean serious consequence for breaking your trading plan. Big time stuff. Not like, oh, I can't eat cookies for a week. Oh, I can't go golfing this weekend. Oh, 
please. So what? Your ego is so big golfing, not golfing for a weekend is a joke. Right? It's like when you put your kid and they've done something really bad and you put them in timeout for 10 minutes. Ooh, that was a big deterrent. No, it's not. No, it's not. You better give yourself something severe, significant. Otherwise, you'll do it again. Why? Because human beings are habitual line steppers. We like to push the envelope of everything we do because we have egos. So until you do that, you will never free yourself from the conscious competence stage. Okay? And this is where most traders find themselves and also the level in which most traders quit. This is the hardest one to overcome, okay? Next, unconscious competence. The trader has had so much practice with a skill, it becomes second nature and can be performed easily without concentrating. Now, do we ever 100% get to this stage as traders? Not really. We get pretty damn close, but not 100%, okay? I don't think about breathing. I don't think about walking. That is what I would call 100% unconscious confidence. Okay? Now, if you had to chew gum and walk, well, it's a tougher story. But my point simply is you'll get to a point in trading where you look at a chart and boom. You're like a computer. Boom, 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 boom. But every once in a while, like today, for example, on Facebook, you might question yourself. So you know this and you know that, but you still struggle once in a while to make that decision. But most of the time, you're unconsciously coming. You've gotten so good at this business. Unwall, for example, with three all or nothing. All or nothing. Is there even a question in his mind? Facebook came eight cents from his target today. Three dollar target, eight cents away. Came all the way back down and stopped him. That's a four thousand dollar swing in his account. Next. Next. I'll complain for five seconds. Damn, that sucked. Damn it. Next. Come on, you need to get to that point in trading, all right? And to do it, you're gonna need that consequence system, all right? So in order to be robotic, and this is a human thing, a human trait, what do people do? Well, we have systems that we follow. We have routines that we follow, right? That's how we accomplish things in life. You have a boss that tells you when to show up and when to go home and tells you what to do in between those times until you've earned the right to have discretion where the boss does not have to micromanage you. But in the beginning, the boss micromanages you to make sure you are following the rules and following the system. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, proper mindset and routine. Routine, 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 routine. Until the routine becomes second nature habit, unconscious confidence. Wake up at the same time, shower at the same time, eat the same thing for breakfast, get to your office at the same time, scan at the same way, et cetera, and so forth. Routine. Without a routine, you're not getting very far, okay? So proper mindset and routine. What do you need to do to put yourself in a proper mindset? Well, that's up to you. Do you need to take a morning jog? Do you need to meditate in the morning? Do you need to watch a, I don't know, a daily dose of Seinfeld? I don't know. But whatever you need to do to get yourself in a proper mindset is very important. Once you've done this, you're going to start your day by developing a market bias. You're going to open up your trading platform, and you're the first thing you're going to do is look at the market. It's the first thing I do every day. Hey, is the market gapping up? Is it gapping down? And if so, what direction is it likely going to go today? You will be wrong on that sometimes, but develop a bias. Why? Because everything you do is, is stemming from that market bias to some extent. Okay, so scan for gaps with that bias in mind. If we have a big time market gap down, say it gaps down 2%, that's a big mega gap down, and you have a stock like, say, Microsoft that's gapping up, holy shnikes, right? Wow, Microsoft's gapping up, it's a market-related stock, and the market's gapping down, massive relative strength. If the market bounces and down 2%, there's a good chance it will, Microsoft's going to rip. That's important to know that bias. Rank the gaps as well as your areas of interest for those gaps. You see, I think a lot of people will look at a gap and they'll go, yeah, it's a nice gap. It's a level one, level two, level three, whatever. But they don't really mark out the areas of interest on those gaps. Well, I'd really like to see it at $37. Why? Well, because it's over that red bar. It's not where it's gapping from, where it's gapping to are both good. It's got relative strength and there's nothing to the left, okay? Next, develop a plan of action for how you're going to trade those gaps, which is kind of what we were just talking about when we talked about areas of interest, right? So great, you like the gap. 
Well, what would you like to see from that gap today? What would be an ideal circumstance or an ideal scenario for you on that gap? Hmm, that's a good question. That would be X, Y, Z. So now you're prepared when it happens. So now you know what you're looking for. So when it happens, you're like, well, I've been looking for this. So it's easy to find. Okay. Review the main bullet points of your trading plan to reinforce good habits, positive thoughts. What does this mean? Every one of you should have a, what I call a trading plan cheat sheet, right? This basically means, so if your trading plan is five or 10 pages, the complete version of it, you might have a one page or a half of a page important review bullet points that you go over every morning. Review those every day so that you're not missing something. You're reinforcing what your plan is doing. Because your plan is God. Your plan is everything. And if you break it, you're going to lose money. Maybe not today, but big picture, you'll lose money. So visualize how you see the day going. Visualize how you see the market opening going based upon your market bias, based upon the gaps you scanned for, and based upon the plan of action that you have given or thought through because of the gaps in the market bias. Visualize how you see that happening. Okay? Then watch, wait, execute. That's it. Watch, wait, and execute. You've done the homework. You've put in the time. You've practiced as many hours as you're going to practice. It's game time now. But you don't go swing at the first pitch. You wait. And then you execute. Per what you talked about before the emotions kicked in, before the market opened. Then you, once you execute, you manage in between. You trust your plan. When you're done all that, the trading day's over, you review your trades, you fill out your tracking spreadsheet, and then you repeat these same steps every single day in exactly the same way until you become, wait for it, unconsciously competent. And then you're going to get to a point where, guess what? All this stuff that we just talked about, it's just second nature. You don't even think about it. Tiger Woods doesn't think about it when he swings a golf club. He's done it a million times. It just happens. But it didn't just happen years ago. He had to work for that to happen. You have to work at this when you're new. And then later on, it just becomes like your left and your right hand, part of the body, part of your routine. Okay? So, here it is. Do what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it without question, no matter how hard it is. Just do it. I hate using slogans from Nike because I can't stand Nike, but... Do what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, without question, no matter how hard it is. And guess what? That will not happen overnight. It's going to take you, quote, years, right, Ben? Years to get good at this. Just like it took eight years to become a doctor. And then you're still a greenhorn after eight years. Heck, you just went through some residencies. So what? You don't have any real experience. Not life experience as a doctor until you have 5, 10, 15 more years. It takes time to do this. This is where the timeline becomes important. If you come into the business with too short of a timeline, you're going to fail. Look at it this way, guys. I haven't used this analogy in a while, but I'll use it today. If you come into the business and you think it's going to take six months to get good at this, but it takes a year, well, two things are going to happen. One, you very well might quit. You might quit because you might think this is taking too long. Or you might get immensely frustrated and lose confidence because you're like, it's taking twice as long as I thought. So I must be dumb. I must be bad because this is taking twice as long as I thought. What if you came in and thought it's going to take three years, but it took two? You'd feel like, wow, man, I'm ahead of schedule. I'm like a year ahead of schedule. So the analogy I give is the airplane analogy. You get onto an airplane, you ask, the pilot comes on and says, today's flight will be four hours and 47 minutes. Okay, mental check, four hours and 47 minutes. The flight is six hours and 47 minutes. You're pissed. It's two hours longer than the pilot said. Mentally, you're prepared for four hours and 47 minutes. You got the kids there, you bought just enough snacks for four hours and 47 minutes. Maybe you could go five hours. Six hours and 47 minutes, you're pissed. What if the pilot comes on and says, today's flight six hours and 47 minutes, ladies and gentlemen, and you get the world's craziest tailwind and it becomes four hours and 47 minutes. You're pleasantly surprised. You're happy. Think about the difference in mindset. 
because that difference in mindset has a lot to do with your approach. When you're thinking all of the time, I'm dumb, why is this taking so long? I must be stupid. You're lacking confidence and you're going in with a negative attitude. But if you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm about where I should be or I'm a little ahead of where I should be because I've given this three or four years, you never get upset with yourself. Not never, but you get less frustrated with yourself. So the right mindset, the right approach is very important in this business. Okay? So... This is robotic indifference. We looked at this chart last week. Blow it up over here. Wide range green bar gets engulfed by a wide range red bar. That's a turnaround bar. Then you get a nice narrow range resting bar. So now our turnaround bar doesn't need the world's widest stop loss. We can have a tighter stop loss because it's a super three bar play. A turnaround bar plus a three bar play. You get in right there at 90.35. Your stop's 91.35. Rip. Goes down four bucks. Almost four R. That's robotic indifference. You see it, you take it, you execute. Watch it, take it, execute it, mark it in your tracking spreadsheet later on. Okay? This, yep, this is idiotic. You know what's robotic? Taking your stop loss at the blue line. You see the difference? This is robotic. This is idiotic. Okay? See the difference? One is the destroyer of worlds. One destroys accounts. The other one grows accounts. I'll repeat it. One of these destroys accounts, the one we're looking at, and the other one builds accounts. You choose which one you want to be, the robot or the idiot. Remember, actions speak louder than words. Don't tell me what you're going to do. Show me what you're going to do. Okay? All right. Let's talk about know the trade. I think this is a, I, I'm actually a little surprised at myself, to be honest with you, um, that I haven't, we've talked about similar topics, but never exactly this. I've talked about the word or the term expectation before, but I'm just surprised at myself. I've never actually done a lecture on this. And I just thought about it the other day. I was like, this really, you haven't it surprised me. But anyway, uh, we have talked about expectation, but not to what we're going to talk about today. All right. So ask yourself some questions. The topic here is know what you're trading. Know what you're trading. So what are breakouts and three bar plays supposed to do? Guys, talk to me. I need some audience participation. What are breakouts and three bar plays supposed to do? Anybody? Give it some thought. What are they supposed to do in a utopian trading world? That's it. Rip. Pop. I know. The new people are going, well, every trade's supposed to work, Jared. I get it. But this type or this style of trade is a momentum play. It's not a chop around, retest support play. It's a rip, hit, and run play. Why? Because you're taking it from an already strong move. A three-bar play is just a very short resting period after a wide-range igniting bar. It should just go. <sighs> okay. That's the expectation. Let's move on. What are clean buy setups and uptrends supposed to do? Go. Maybe not rip the way a breakout, but they're supposed to go. What are 100% retracement double bottom retests supposed to do? Oh, that's a little different. They bounce but they don't bounce straight to the moon. They chop. Sometimes the double bottom retest becomes a triple bottom retest, does it not? Sometimes the double bottom retest bounces and pulls back 50% and then bounces again. Now, obviously the quality is important, but these are not the same expectation as a breakout or a three bar play. You're not expecting to get into a double bottom retest and have this thing just shoot the moon. The expectation's different. What are climactics, parabolics supposed to do? Chop. That's what they do. They bounce. And remember, what's the line I say frequently? In fact, I think it's out of the textbook. What's the line I say frequently? Anyone? Guys, this might take two entries. Almost always when we get into a climactic, I tell you guys, hey guys, 
These can be whippy and spready and sloppy. This might take two entries. So with that in mind, now we have what? We have an expectation. And because of that expectation, we now have a modus operandi. We have a guide for what is supposed to happen. Now we have to make a decision, what if that doesn't happen? Because the expectation was for A to happen, but what if B starts happening? What do we do? Well, let's talk about this. Okay, so how do 100% double bottom retests usually act? Well, I just told you, right? They usually chop around. Now, sure, of course it's possible. It could just rip higher. That's, that's awesome, right? That would be wonderful if that happened. I'm not complaining. But what if it doesn't? Well, the expectation wasn't for it to just hit and run. And this is a smooth pullback. It's a little retest. There was a big bottoming tail. Yeah, it's a little bit under the moving average, but lower high, lower high, lower high. Relatively smooth pullback. All in all, I see, hey, not a bad, not a bad play. We don't have the volume on here, but not a bad play. So once you know how they are supposed to trade, only then can you determine if your bar-by-bar -bar analysis is correct. So what would you do if this happened? You see where I'm going with this? Okay, what would you do, guys, if you have your double bottom retest? And oh, by the way, look at the trigger bar over here. I should have put an arrow to it. Okay, in fact, let's do that real quick. All right, let's take this right here right there, move this over, right there. That's your trigger bar. That's the entry trigger bar, okay? What the heck happened? It triggered on right after the green bar, so you even got to change the color bar, and left a massive topping tail and shook. Now, this is why we tend to use the prior pivot low. We talk about it all the time, so don't tell me it's new information. Shook, wide range green bar, then you get some topping tail, topping tail, topping tail, pulls back. Guys, this is doing what? what they typically do. We know these types of patterns often, quote, wiggle around. So it was far less concerning watching it chop around before going higher. But what if a three bar play did the same thing? Would we have the same attitude if a three bar play left multiple topping tails or red bars? The answer is unequivocally and clearly no. But this type of trade, the expectation here is that we're not going to get a rip right off of it. If it does, great, sweet. If not, these require wiggle room. Hence, the stop goes under the prior pivot low. Know what you're trading. Know it. So if it starts to wiggle, don't walk away from it. Give it a chance. Doesn't mean you'll always be right, but give it a chance. Okay. How do three bar plays usually act? Wide bar, narrow bar? You get in right down here, well, we just talked about it. They're usually momentum trades. They hit and run. So, therefore, now what? We know that good three-bar plays are momentum-type trades, and if they don't move quickly, they usually fail. So, seeing the wide-range green bar engulfing coming in early, the wide-range engulfing bar coming in early, was a huge warning sign that this trade wasn't going to work. So let's do this one. Move this over here. Right there. Move it over. Right there. Okay? So when you see this thing trigger the three-bar play, and the next bar after the trigger bar, the entry bar is a wide-range green bar. It's not going to work. In this case, it gave us an opportunity to get out at break-even. I only got half my shares out. I took a half hour loss on it. What did it do? This thing went to like 173. And remember, I complained. I bitched and moaned like a little child in a safe space about, oh, I, should have, I should have gone long on this. Remember? We should have gone long. We should have gone long. It told us it wasn't going to work. A wide range green engulfing bar. Then a double bottom retested with a bottom. It's not going to work. And the expectation is a momentum trade. That's the expectation. Don't sit around and let it stop you out. It showed you its hand. And in this case, you were fortunate enough that it let you out at break even. Not always will it let you out. So for example, okay, for example, if this just kept going, there's nothing you can do. You would have just been stuck in it and you would have taken a full stop. 
But sometimes you get fortunate and they'll give you an opportunity to get out for a smaller loss or break even. Okay? Now, how do high of the day wedge plays usually act? Right? Wide range green bar, bottoming tail, bottoming tail, bottoming tail. This is a very, very bullish looking chart. Very bullish looking chart. This is a hit and run type trade. This is not a chop around type trade. So, is this surprising that it stopped out after the green bar was engulfed by a red bar? The initial pop was mediocre, decent. Great, no, bad, no, okay. And then what happens? It comes back down on a red bar, these little bottoming tail, and then another red bar. It's a foregone conclusion. No follow through, get out. It's a momentum play. If it doesn't have momentum, then it's not acting the way you want it to act because it's a momentum play without momentum, which means it's likely going to fail. Now, again, there will be times you will be wrong. The question here is how frequently does that happen? If you do this properly, you should be right about 90% of the time. 90. You heard me. You should make a mistake one time out of 10, maybe two. Maybe two. The bars are telling you something. And understanding the expectation is hugely important, okay? So, be robotic. I want to talk about this chart for a couple minutes. At first glance, this is a little off topic. I don't even know why I threw this in, but it's in, so let's just talk about it, okay? At first glance, what do we have? A little breakout here maybe at 120. This thing rips up to 123, and you're going, whoa, 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 entry short. It's above the moving average there. What are you talking about, Willis? 121.55 by 122.15. Are you nuts, man? And then it, all of a sudden it works. How did you know that? This is another area you guys are not doing a good enough job with regard to expectation. Okay? Look at it now. Does your opinion change? Look at the left. Look at the $120 area. This thing is up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 nine bars in a row and the last two are wide range bars on monster volume into a triple top double top whatever you want to call it and we go back this time frame five minute rips two minute whatever it is wide range bar far from the moving average this is an interesting short but i'm not really interested so much in the interesting short as much as you guys making sure you're still looking at the higher time frames when you're taking these trades. We had somebody this morning ask about a stock. Was it DB? I can't remember what the stock was. It was up five days, and it was gapping up today. What are you doing? What are you doing? There's 3,000 other stocks to choose from. Why do you need to trade that one? I want you guys to burn that in your head, ingrain that in your head. There are three, four, five thousand stocks to choose from. Why that one? There better be a damn good reason for you trading, quote, that one. Five days up is too many. Okay? Right? Five days up is too many. Braden, I'm disappointed with you. I'm really disappointed with that comment. For those of you not seeing it, the comment says, shorting a ripping stock is a hard way to make money. I, I say that all the time. What's different, Braden? What's different? Anybody? What's different? Why would I be disappointed in hearing that comment? A little crickety in here. Step up. Come on. Yes. Almost every one of those that I say that about is a stock that's up five, six, seven days in a row with nothing to the left. Nothing to the left. This has a bunch of junk to the left including wide-range ending bars on high volume. If a stock's ever going to pull back, it's this. Now, does this mean it's going to do 100% retracement down to 106? Heck no! That's not what we're saying. We're saying that this is so extended into resistance on volume that it will pull back and likely bounce later. But during this pullback, if you want to jump down or drop down to the one- or two-minute chart, you can probably get yourself a short entry here. Okay? So think about that. All right? And that's what it looks like on top of each other, just so you can kind of have an idea, because you should be looking at these next to each other. 
all right? Now, be robotic, not idiotic. I'm going to leave you with that. Why? Because you need to recognize, no matter what I talk about and how many times I talk about it, money management is always your number one job. So if you're going to make a mistake, make a mistake with a target. If you're going to make a mistake, make a mistake where maybe you take too many trades. Make that mistake. Miss a target by a little. Get out a little too soon. Never, ever make the mistake of not taking a stop loss. Don't ever do it. And the worst kind are the kinds that you get away with. And they will happen. Because a lot of times if you don't take a stop loss, the stock will eventually come back to your entry or above. But it only takes the one or two times to do irreparable damage to your account. The not worth it kind of damage to your account. You know, the kind where a stock drops from 80 to 12. So now you're bag holding and your account is down 80%. That's not worth it. If you're going to make a mistake, and what do they say? I, what's that golfing term? If you're going, what's it? Somebody give it to me. If you're going to miss, miss close. I can't remember what they call it. Um, there's a term out there, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, but if you're going to make a mistake, make the kind where you're making money. Okay? Miss long? Yeah. Don't make this kind of mistake. So at the end of the day, for everything I teach you guys, expectation, robotic indifference, all this stuff, take your stop losses, use good money management. Okay? Use good money management. Uh, Adam, we actually only ever risk 1% on intraday trades. Um, if you want to risk 2% on swing trades, I think it's aggressive. Um, and the reason I don't subscribe to that attitude is because you'll run out of buying power. You will absolutely run out of buying power using 2% um, trading unless you have 10 or 21 leverage, but nobody has that overnight. If you're swing trading and you're doing 2%, how many trades can you realistically actually take? Unless you're trading a whole bunch of penny stocks, you're not going to be able to take a lot of trades at one time. Okay, so today's lesson, today's topic, be robotic, not idiotic. Understand the process involved with getting to unconscious confidence. Understand the years that are involved with getting to unconscious confidence, okay? Then, on top of learning unconscious confidence, on top of having a daily routine, a market bias, a plan of action, and visualizing your day, also understand, as a recap, what the expectations for your trades are. Because they matter. They matter significantly on whether or not that trade is reacting the way it's supposed to be reacting. If it's not, you might want to put some rules into your plan about how to protect yourself from taking a full stop out. Save your money, okay? So I hope you guys learned a little bit about becoming a better trader, saving some money, and developing a routine. I am Jared Wesley of Live Traders. We will get back at it again next week.